Well, finally, here we are at the last Sunday of this incredible year. And we're so glad that you have been part of our fellowship and virtual community. And we look back at what has happened and know that we can thank God for all of the things that have happened. And we know that they are difficult days and even more unbearable days for many of us. It's been trying, it's been tumultuous, and it's been a time of great uh, trouble for, for the world. But we can look ahead and continue to be grateful for what God is going to accomplish in our lives. And speaking of grateful for me personally and as a family, Christmas and the closing of the year is uh, our true time of uh, giving thanks. So I'd like to start things off by expressing my deepest appreciation to the Lord for how he has carried us through this year. And because of who he is, we know that he will continue to be faithful and true. I also would like to thank my wife, who has truly been God's gift to me and our kids and our bigger family. You may not see her a lot on screen, but believe me, she's been present, praying, encouraging, and supporting us as a family, as our ministry this year has taken an unexpected turn with this pandemic. I also thank my children for their patience and understanding, as they too had to make adjustments and adapt to the many changes brought about by the current circumstances. I thank our healthcare workers and all our frontline workers who brave each day going to work. The workplaces of today have truly become a battlefield. I thank them for their courage and commitment to ensure that the rest of us are safe and well. I'm especially thankful for our nurses, our doctors, and even Instacart shoppers. I value your services so highly, especially because there are many of us who are dealing with health issues that prevent us from doing even the most basic task of buying groceries. I imagine the sacrifice you make in buying for those who cannot, enduring long hours in stores and on the road amidst very difficult weather. You deserve medals and honor from all of us. I thank my partners in ministry, my fellow pastors, who kept up the excitement in taking, service, taking up service in the Lord's work with the willingness to keep on going even when their own situations were fraught with challenges. Thank you to the leadership of our board and for, for all of us who have been given the privilege of leading our church into a year that is expected to bring in a new set of challenges. Thank you to uh, our volunteers from, from all the way from our tech team, members of our young people who pursued in close fellowship with one another, to our Sunday school teachers, our worship leaders, scripture readers, our praise and worship teams, to all our growth groups, our dedicated growth group facilitators, devotional leads, all of you who have stepped in and stepped up, even more so this year, when they realized that God demanded more from us as he shifted us into a virtual territory that's new for us. You served with such tireless dedication and commitment that's been inspiring and encouraging for many of us. I thank God for all of you, for our church partners, to GCF Halton and York, for your contributions in making this year possible, for our friends and family who became a regular addition to our fellowship and worship services, for our guests, and for all of you, my brothers and sisters, who have been such an integral part of this community of God's children. I'm not certain what our ministries and outreaches will look like in the coming year, but I know that we will all be a part of it together. I pray that we will remain steadfast and unwavering, even when more of the changes God will bring require more per perseverance, patience, and endurance on our part. It is my sincerest appeal to all of you that we remain thankful as we brace for another demanding year ahead. Being thankful allows us to breathe a sigh of relief with all the tensions we're experiencing. I always love that we get to greet each other this time of the year with Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. They go perfectly together somehow. With the birth of Christ, we are taken into God's new covenant with mankind ushering the completion of his promises made long ago to bless us in a way that's fresh and lasting. It is Christ's longing 
that he be birthed into your life more than he did once in the manger. And that as you welcome his presence into your life, that you will become a new being in him. Jesus explained why he came to our world in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. That thief, our sworn enemy, has placed a lot of adversities in our path. He has taken and tried to take more away from us. But our future and hope is secure in Christ. The hope that Christ brings is not just for another year that brings an immaculate start, but the continuation of a renewed life filled with fresh promises, fulfilled in bringing us closer to his ultimate plan, personally and for the world. This year, like no other, welcoming the new year comes with both aspiration and anticipation because of what this passing year has been like. We can exclaim Happy New Year as we say goodbye to this one, but also with exhaustion um, and some, some sigh to welcome it with trepidation, sensing that the overflow of this year's trial, trials will also pour out into this coming year. We have that spirit that celebrates but also we have that spirit that contemplates about what holds for us in the coming year. In that spirit, let me read to you a message that a colleague of mine wrote that expresses this overwhelming sense of exhaustion and acceleration at the same time. He wrote, I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and happy, happy holidays. As I near signing off for vacation, I can feel all the tension in my body that has built up over this difficult year starting to tremble. I'm sure the dam is going to break soon and there will be a massive letting go, an emotional purging of 2020 at some point. Think we all need that. The holidays will be more emotional for many of us who won't be seeing family for gatherings, which in past years we would have taken for granted. Nothing taken for granted this time which is why I wanted to say how grateful I am to have this team of kind and good people. Here's looking to 2021, a better year, something easier on the soul, eh? Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and definitely a happy new year. You know, I shared that tension personally with him and it's okay for us to feel this. It's okay for us to ask these hard questions. What's the next stage of this pandemic? What new thing is waiting for us during this crisis? What's next for our church? What new thing will God lead us to? We've all been tried and tested by this pandemic. It didn't get any easier when we entered another lockdown just yesterday. The stark and sad reality that this pandemic is not yet over just hurts us a little more, especially to those who are struggling with the stress of isolation, with loss of jobs, and slowly losing hope as a result. Businesses are at the brink of despair and bankruptcy. And worse, we see many more who are dying from their fight against this illness. Wounds remain open as people cannot grieve like they used to. Because of this crushing grief that many experience at different levels, people may not necessarily welcome well-intentioned gestures to reassure them that God is in control that God has a reason for all of these trials. When this, hurt, when this hurt becomes more real than hope, perhaps we need more than just comfort. We need a different way of asking these difficult questions. When, God's, when God moves, we know he's trying to accomplish something. He's not wasting any of these events in our lives. The question becomes, how are we recognizing those, move God's, those moves that God makes and how are we responding to them? This question forms the basis of our last first sermon for this year. What are you up to with what God is up to? Basically, what are you doing with what God is doing? So regardless of whether you believe in God's authority and sovereignty, it is still important to ask how you're welcoming the next stage of your life, even when you feel that there may not be anything new in the coming year. Let's go to a passage in scripture that's not too far nor distant from the time Jesus Christ was born. A passage that I pray helps us understand how we can not only brace for what's next, but brace, embrace it altogether. This passage takes us to the story of Anna, 
I praise God that he has entrusted several oblivious short passages of unknown characters in the Bible that are as significant as the bigger narratives across this beautiful book. We are blessed to have two of these stories that immediately follow the story of the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2, that of Simeon and the other of a widow named Anna. We are going to focus on Anna's story. I also love the fact that God committed the story of this woman to us in his word, another testimony that women are not undermined nor undervalued in God's kingdom. The genealogy of Christ that Pastor Nary walked us through last Sunday is evidence of this, that God uses who he can, regardless of your status or age in life, whatever circumstances you have, to teach and point us to himself. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. The only passage in scripture that mentions Anna. It's all we know about her. During this pandemic, and at any other time in our modern world, we speak of the most vulnerable in our society. Anna would be counted among them, but in so many more ways than just her age. Notice the passage starts with, and there was a prophetess. Because there was another character by the name of Simeon who preceded her story. All taking place in the temple. Joseph and Mary, Jesus' earthly parents, found themselves in the temple as the Jewish religious rituals prescribed that at the birth of a son, an animal sacrifice be offered as part of the purification and dedication ceremonies. This event would have occurred very early on in Christ's infancy. The first thing we are told about her is that she's a prophetess, a person whom God uses to bring a specific insight or instruction for an intended audience. The Bible doesn't tell us, however, in what specific capacity or message that God entrusted her with. Perhaps it was in the way that she brought this specific word about Jesus, which also may explain one of the reasons why she's in the temple in the first place. Regardless, the word prophetess is simply a designation and a description for someone who spoke the word of God to his people, like we will see her doing later in verse 38. The same verse continues, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Personally, what's most interesting for me is this description Luke makes about her own heritage among God's people. If you remember the Old Testament history, you know that the kingdom split after Solomon's time. The 10 tribes in the north formed an independent nation with their own king. From then on in the Old Testament, the name Israel applied to the northern kingdom, who became largely rebellious and idolatrous. The southern kingdom took the name Judah. That was because Judah was by far the larger of the two remaining tribes in the south, the other one being Benjamin. The southern kingdom remained loyal to the throne of David, but a few faithful Israelites from each of the ten tribes in the north, in the northern kingdom of Israel, migrated south so that they weren't cut off from the temple. But in doing so, they gave up their family lands and their inheritance. Judah and Israel remained independent from one another and divided for many generations. The tribe of Asher, where Anna traces her heritage is one of the tribes in the rebellious northern kingdom. In describing her heritage in this way, Luke seems to be impressing upon us, his readers, that though her tribe departed from the Lord, she was a part of the believing remnant from the northern kingdom. Luke is reminding us that where we come from and the family we're born into is not as important as what God can do through us. We are all recipients of God's grace. Anna's story proves that God overcomes our appalling genealogy or origin to show his amazing grace. Through his own plan, God had prepared Anna through her national heritage, her background, her origin, and her personal devotion to be a witness of Christ in his infancy. Through hundreds of years of ancestry, In a lifetime of faithful service, the Lord brought her into a personal encounter with his son and set her on a mission to tell others about him. 
The same verse continues to tell us more about her in that she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage. Anna is advanced in years. That's the Bible's friendly way of telling us that she's not just old, but really old. I don't recommend, though, that you start asking people how advanced in years they are, regardless of how friendly it sounds. There are better ways to ask people how old they are, even if you have to use sign language, okay? There seems to be some confusion, though, as to how old she really is. Some probably say she's 84, based on the passage you will see later. And some say she's 105 years old when you account for the time when she actually got widowed. Doesn't seem to be that important to Luke, who wrote this uh, uh, wonderful gospel. Um, so we'll leave it at that. God is telling you and I, through Anna's story, that he is an overcomer of limitations. He doesn't exclude you because of your age or any visible or invisible disability or handicap. Remember that it is God's ability and not our own that gives us that empowerment to serve and make a difference. That's where he thrives in using our limitations to display his limitless potential. Only in God and through him can that happen. And we move to verse 37, which is really a short passage. There's only three verses that we're dealing with today. And it reads, And then as a widow to the age of 84, she did not leave the temple ground serving night and day with fasts and prayers. What's more important is that even at this age, whether we consider her to be 84 or 105, Anna did not use her situation as an exemption in serving the Lord. The Bible tells us that she lost her husband early in her marriage. That's a big loss. Losing a spouse is the most traumatic and tragic loss that a married person will deal with in life. If Anna was a member of a church today and she suffered such a loss, the church would understand if she just called it quits in ministry and gave up, folded up, as she deals with such pain and suffering. But not Anna. She would not count herself out because God did not. Aside from the ministry of prophecy, she devoted herself to praying and fasting in the temple. She wanted to be near God and near the Jews who come to worship God in his temple. She could have chosen to isolate herself after such a devastating loss. But she took to the temple and took the Lord's message of redemption through his son upon her lips and into the lives of others. She chose not to wallow and weep in her misery, but worship. Anna proves to us that because God is always doing something good through our difficult circumstances, we can choose to move along with him despite of them. Those of us who see restrictions in making excuses about how and why we can't serve the Lord I think really failed to see the power God can have in us and through us. Many of us have, have made more shallow excuses about not being directly involved in the Lord's work or participating in the Lord's work. We use the excuse of our jobs, our family, our finances, where we live, our talents, our studies. The list goes on for all the excuses we have to make before God who made us possible and had placed us where we are today. I pray we all look to Anna as encouragement and look to the Lord for empowerment as he is always in the business of transforming lives in ways that will bless more than just ourselves. And how did Anna choose to participate in the Lord's work? In prayer and fasting. Spiritual disciplines that unfortunately have been overlooked in our churches today. They are not very popular ministries, so they are not well attended, especially fasting, given our culture of plenty and consumption. We like to eat and eat, and more than just apples and bananas. We are never satisfied. Having just been a few days after Christmas, many of you may feel like you need to fast just to clear the way for all that food to pass through. So 
that's what I've been telling you about the story of Anna, that God is always doing something good through our difficult circumstances so we can choose to move along with him despite of them. In the last verse of this short narrative, when Anna saw the infant Jesus, after having seen and heard from Simeon's own testimony about the Savior child, verse 38 tells us that and at that very moment, that very moment she gazed upon the infant Jesus. She came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak about him to all those who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Giving thanks was Anna's first response in encountering Jesus Christ. How could she not? All her life as a widowed prophetess may have been spent understanding the revelations that God was passing to her about the Messiah. And now that he's here in front of her, she had no other words to say but appreciation for living long enough to see God come through with his promises. Similar in response to Simeon. After she gave thanks, she also gave her testimony to the people about the Savior who has been born to the world for its redemption. Anna didn't stay just in that space of gratitude. She moved on and continued to be grateful by sharing the good news to everyone else. Anna's life was indeed full. It was full of strife, but it was also filled with hope that worked its way into a life full of service in the most often unadmired service of fasting and prayer. And encountering Christ personally, she expressed her gratitude and extended the gospel to those who were also looking forward to such good news. Some of us may feel that Anna's religious life is a bit excessive, maybe to those who don't know what sacrifice and devotion are like. It will certainly feel and look that way. Maybe to those who may not know the right response, to who God had to give and give up so that we may have a chance at eternal life. But to Anna, it's probably the least she can do in worshiping the God who has seen her through her tragic days as a widow. She is a strong reminder that because God counted you in by his grace, you can choose to make yourself count for the gospel. Let me repeat that because that's very important for us to hear today. She is a strong reminder that because God counted you in by his grace, you can choose to make yourself count for the gospel. Let me share a few lessons with you before we end and to offer some insights to the questions we started with. Lessons and answers that I pray we will carry through into the new years, not just this year, the new years that are coming to us, God willing. You know, one of the things that I reflect on this story is Anna went to the temple regularly to worship because that's the designated place for the Jews to meet with God. But we rejoice knowing that in Jesus coming into our lives, our bodies have become God's temple. So wherever we are is where we can worship. God's church is a body and not a building. That's a huge consolation for us during this pandemic as our fellowship thrive in the midst of distance. And this explains why our virtual gatherings have thrived in the midst of a very difficult situation. The next lesson I want to share is that your expectation of God and understanding of who he truly is will determine how radical you're prepared to be and what sacrifice you're ready to make to welcome God's next and new move in your life. If you have a big God, you can expect him to come through in a big way. If you think lesser of him, then the things you will commit to will measure up in the same way. Worship is not a collection of sentimental moments or emotional experience, but a regular counter with the living God, embracing his presence through the faithful disciplines of fasting and prayer. Those who walk closely with God welcomes every difficulty as one of life's greatest opportunities to worship him even more intimately. Such is the story of Anna. Jesus Christ has always been God's new covenant with us. He represents the new arrangement God is making. Perhaps God's next for you and the new thing for you 
is to consider Jesus Christ, who came to the cradle all the way to the cross. When all human hope fades and wanes, God's love becomes even more intense. It was in those dark days of deafening silence where God didn't speak a word of prophecy to Israel for 400 years that God came through when he brought his one and only son, Jesus, to save the world. He was worth the wait. You may be alone or feel alone, even with the company of many. You may feel isolated. You may feel unrecognized. You may feel unattended to, but God sees you. God reserved a very short passage in his word for Anna, an inconspicuous character, but very much loved by God. You are not inconspicuous to God. He knows where you are, and he knows where he is taking you. Recognize Jesus Christ for who he is. Be willing to move when he does. Truth be told, he is already moving now to prompt you to turn away from your sin and see him as your Lord and Savior. What God is up to in Christ is to save you from your life of sin and bring you eternal life through his son. So what will you be doing with that truth? I pray that you will receive it with wisdom and gladness and respond to it in obedience and repentance. I end this message with words from the Apostle Paul entrusted to his young disciple, Timothy. It somehow echoes the words and the truth we heard about Anna. Anna would have loved to hear these words too, and I hope you embrace it as inspiration for the closing of this year and as we all welcome the new and the next move of God in our lives. Paul said, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us, to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And he continues from verse 11, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. Until that day. And whenever that comes, and however that comes, let's keep praising and serving God no matter where God takes us <clears throat> and have the faith to move along with whatever it is that God is doing. I invite you all to pray with me. Father, you sent your son into a world that rejected him. That includes us. You know the pain of rejection because you suffered it from us. Do not let these words from you get rejected today. Don't let it sit in neglect because we are too busy or too preoccupied living our lives. Do not let us ignore your message today either, but rather ignite the fire in our souls that we all need as we challenge ourselves with the question of how we're moving along with your movement in our lives. As a church, teach us to respond in unity and harmony with one another. Individually, teach us to respond in sincerity of service. Gift us with a service that doesn't entertain any excuses. You did not make any excuses when you chose to die for us, even when we were still sinners. Help us embrace that love and charity as we seek to touch others with the love you've shown us. Help us do this with generosity and compassion. To those of us who continue to hurt, or face the defeating place of hopelessness. Pour your Holy Spirit that we may face the dim future with the brightness of your promises and presence. We thank you for how you will meet us where we are and how you will give the answers to these prayers. For we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. And since Christmas has just passed a few days ago, uh, I'd like to greet you again. A Merry Christmas and a blessed new year ahead.